That's right, crew. It is time to stock this boat for passage. Philip and I leave for Cuba in just seven days, and we had a ton of provisions to get on the boat. I wanted to share with you some of our meal planning, how we inventory the boat, some provisions we use and why, and share with you some tips and tricks we've picked up along the way about offshore voyaging, including power conservation and sleeping arrangements, watch schedule, all sorts of good stuff. That way, if you're planning an offshore voyage, hopefully you can find some of these tips helpful and get out there on blue water soon. Philip and I leave for Cuba in just one week. All right, so a lot to talk about here today. I'm gonna try as best I can to explain to you guys how we pack things, how we organize them and inventory them when we're gonna go offshore like this for a long time. We have to put a lot of stuff on the boat. Um, it is just a maybe five, six, seven day passage to Cuba, but once we're there, you know, we don't know if we'll be able to restock water and get groceries easily. Um, also going back to Key West, it may be really expensive there and we don't wanna spend all of our time like making runs to the grocery store. So if we can have everything we need on the boat, you know, anytime we need to eat, shower, bathe, do whatever we want on the boat, it's nice to just have that there. I mean, this stuff's not gonna go bad. So it's all, not all of it's dried goods, but today I'm doing the dried goods is what I'm doing today. Um, we're gonna do produce next week. <laughs> we are 10 days out from departure as I film this. Um, so provisioning is full underway on plaintiff's rest. Mainly we have this little palace right here. Yeah, packed it all on the floor just to make it look real dramatic. <laughs> That's how we pack it for the trip. We just shove it in the corner. I'm kidding. I'll show you where we put it. We've got a lot of goods here. Um, canned goods, our thought processes, uh, meats, veggies, you know, lots of easy things to eat. We've got uh, a lot of soups, um, a lot of chicken broth for cooking so we can make um, easily like rice or quinoa. We're gonna do a good bit of produce before we leave. Mostly stuff that also doesn't need to be refrigerated really hearty things, broccoli, carrots, um, cabbage, cauliflower, stuff like that, lots of fruits. And um, we'll do a good bit of probably some chicken and a couple things, maybe of beef or pork, you know, just a few. And then we'll do some frozen meals that are already made, like big pasta dishes, like uh, chili or spaghetti or bolognese or, you know, things that are kind of one pot meals, um, frozen, ready to go. So that's part of our big meal plan. These are mostly the in-between, or when we um, run out of, it's totally possible, um, good, uh, you know, frozen or refrigerated items. We have to have a backup so we can eat somehow. So that's kind of what I'm packing on the boat today is our dried goods provisions. And I'll show you what we normally do. I have it on the iPad here, inventory on the boat. Um, everything, every single locker that we fill, we have it uh, categorized by a number, you know, what number the locker is, what it's called, they all have silly names, you know, like the spice cabinet, the cereal cabinet, the tool drawer, you know, you just sort of develop these over time. But we have an inventory of what's in there, and so we keep up with that. I'll show you here on the iPad. It's pretty intense, right? <laughs> um, it's, it takes a while to make in the beginning an inventory like that, uh, but super necessary as you're going along because maybe you want just like that one can of tomato paste to make whatever meal you're making, some chili or something. If you have no idea where it's at, it could take you 20 minutes to go through all the different lockers, pull out all the cans, reach all the way to the back. Um, so it's good to have a list like that. You're like, at least I know it's in locker number 10, you know, and then you're there and you can start going through just that locker to find it. Also, that's how we keep up with um, what we've eaten and so what else we need to buy when we need to breathe provision. So every time we, we try as best we can, <laughs> it sometimes is hard to keep up with. But say if I eat a can of peas, um, then I'm gonna go on the inventory wherever I got them. And if it was four cans of peas, I just scratch through the four and put a three. That way we know we got three left or two or one, and then we're out. And then we start a reprovision list uh, along the way of stuff that we wanna buy. So that's why it's helpful. It's definitely good to inventory your stuff. And this is just for food. We also do it, it's even more important um, to do it for your spares. You know, how many fuel filters do you have? How many zincs do you have? How many impellers? All that kind of stuff. And we're gonna talk about that next time. We're gonna do a video on all of our safety equipment on the boat, um, both for personal safety, um, safety of the boat, we kind of call it in case anything goes wrong that we want to um, 
you know, or have to, want to, you never want to, you have to do repairs along the way as you're going, you know, if there's things you have to change out and replace. So we're going to talk about that next Today time. I'm mostly talking about stowing the boat, stowing things on the boat and um, packing the boat for a passage. And I'll show you Philip's list. Uh, he's head chef on the boat for sure. And so he's made a um, list of several sort of meals he wants to make with our fresh stuff, you know, our um, refrigerated meats or refrigerated produce, like a nice just home cooked meal. We'll start those in the beginning. And then he also has um, the frozen meals that we're going to make that I've talked about. And we've done those before where it's just a bag and all you do is boil water and put the bag in the water, um, a Ziploc bag. Just make sure it doesn't, um, you may want to double bag it because if the water starts to get into your chili or your soup or whatever you made, it'll dilute it. And then you have a nice, um, you know, from frozen, but home cooked meal as well. Something nice and warm and hearty. Great on passage if it's been like a long, cold, kind of drizzly day. That is an awesome uh, crew morale boosters. Have a, just a frozen meal ready to go. A lot of the things you kind of don't usually eat, but you may want to think about for passage. Um, we've got instant coffee, which Philip, oh God, would never drink that on a normal day. He's not picky, but he definitely loves good coffee. Um, but this may be, you know, you wake up 2 a.m. night shift and it's not great conditions to like make a pot of coffee. This is better than nothing. So that's kind of some of the things that you wouldn't normally get, but you get just for passage stuff. We do, um, we do a lentil soup because we are going to bring a pressure cooker. Uh, definitely recommend that for uh, just cruising in general. I mean, it cooks things in sort of a fraction of the time, which is good. So you're using a fraction of your resources, like your propane or your water. Or, you know, and your time also, so you don't have to wait on something for four hours, it just takes an hour, so pressure cooker is awesome. We do a lentil soup recipe, which is super easy. Lentil soup, chicken broth, uh, carrots and onions, and it goes like 45 minutes, and you just kind of throw it in the pot, good to go, and it's a real hearty soup, and makes a lot of leftovers you can eat the next day. Uh, for lunch, sort of throw to go-to meals is uh, corn, black beans, and rotel. Um, just throw that in a bowl. It's great just like that. You can do some little salt, pepper, oregano, nothing big, all dried spices. Um, anything uh, papery, papery, that's Annie's term today. You know, like a dried um, package that could get moisture in it. We bag in a separate uh, bag itself in case you stow it in a compartment that has water intrusion for whatever reason, you know, water comes in. Um, sometimes that's not the end of the, the world. It's just it got in a locker and you have to clean it out. But if you lose your food in the process, then it can be more of a, you know, morale blow and more of a problem than it was just if water came in. So definitely sack all your stuff that if it gets wet, it will ruin in separate bags. And all these tricks are Phillips. He's really good at all this. He does it. I just pack it away. All right. These guys I've kind of talked about, we call this UHT milk. It's milk that doesn't have to be refrigerated and just sip on them and then fill them up later. So we don't have to take up all this room in the fridge and anything. I'm sure you guys know this, but anything in cardboard will obviously be taken out. We want less packaging as possible. No more boxes. We're going to have so much packing to do. Um, but this is probably all of our dried goods. Probably one more run um, of produce, maybe a little alcohol, you know, we're really close, so that's good. There's 10 days out, we better be. This is going to be our first uh, longest trip, just Philip and I going straight from Pensacola to Cuba. I think it's about, I don't know, five or 600 nautical miles. Um, so it'll be a straight shot, you know, probably a five to six day, maybe six day, five night passage for us. And the longest we've done, I think is two two nights in about three days, like two and a half days. Um, so this will be definitely a fun test for us in that regard to see how we like traveling, just the two of us for that long of distance. Cause we've done, you know, the Atlantic crossing, we've been out and away from shore for very long periods of time and know that we love that. Uh, but we've never done it just two crew. So this will be a real good test for us. So in that and on our boat now, where it's a different situation um, where Yannick had a lot more solar power coming in, we are really concerned about power and conserving it because we want to make sure the main system on the boat we want to make sure has lots of juice and love, I guess there's two, is um, the autopilot because we want it to steer as much as it possibly can. Uh, the joy of hand steering is fun, but I don't want to do it for six days. <laughs> and the instruments, you know, our chart plotter, our GPS, our, all of our navigational, you know, inhaling devices, communication, all of that. So the electronics, I guess we'll call it and the autopilot. Those are the two things that we want to make sure get as much juice as they possibly need the entire trip. 
And we have on our boat, those of you who have uh, seen our tour are real familiar with this or have followed the blog. We have three solar panels. So we've got one 100 watt and two 50 watt. Uh, you can kind of see this one's shiny new. These are kind of old and hazy. Um, we just replaced this one. That's what happened there. Is, um, that was one of the things of our Cuba prep was replacing that solar panel. It was all cracked and not working very well and not putting in power. So I think it's just age, you know, they just don't last forever. And, and then this replacement one, I want to say it was around two to 300, maybe 200 to just pop in a new panel there. So definitely not going to like really break your budget, which is great. But these, since we've put them on, um, we went from, we used to get about a day and a half kind of the batteries just on their own. And then with solar power coming in, say we're on the hook and not running the engine, we have about four, four and a half days, you know, depending on how conservative we are with power, um, which is great, but that wouldn't be enough to get us all the way down running the, um, like I said, the electronics and the hydraulic autopilot. So power. One of the things that we usually always are running um, when we're on the boat is the refrigerator. Here's our DC panel here. And right now I've got our cabin lights port and starboard on, but they're not doing anything. We check our battery levels here. So I can tell right now point one is going in. That's a positive number going in. So we're getting power from the shore power. And that's zeroed out too, because we're nice and full. Everything's great. So we'll go right here. Let's turn off the shore power. And we'll turn off everything for just a little bit, just so I can do a test for you. Now we're pulling 0.5 off. So the negative means we're pulling stuff off the batteries, means we're using power. And I'm gonna click on the fridge and I'll show you what happens. So now we're pulling off, you know, between four and at times five, 5.7. Um, our fridge is not very efficient, it's older. It's a 1985 original, so um, it's definitely pulls a good bit of power, especially when it kicks on, like they kick on and then they turn off and just remain cool. But when they sense they're getting a little too warm, they kick on again. So when it kicks on, it'll draw like five amps an hour. That's a good bit of power for six days. So our plan is, as I turn this off, get us back on shore of our What Philip and I have decided to do for the trip down to Cuba is not run the fridge at all. We're going to instead just treat it like primarily an icebox. Uh, I guess the olden days is where the term icebox came from. But um, it is, you know, pretty well insulated. We've replaced these strips before. We've also, if you look inside, you'll see our fancy great foam job um, to try to keep, you know, cold air in there. So it's pretty well insulated. And um, what we're gonna do is just put big blocks of ice in there. So another thing we did in effort to uh, conserve power on the fridge is freeze jugs. I think we've only done the one so far. So we bought um, distilled, that way we can use it for the battery if we need it, and also to drink it. And what we did is pour just a little bit out so when we froze it, the expansion, you know, it wouldn't crack the container. We're trying to make sure it's not compromised because um, we're going to stick these in the fridge on the boat and let them be like big ice blocks just to keep it cold for like the first two, three days of the passage. And as they melt, the hope is there's no cracks and no water will leak. And then it will just become a jug of water that can be used for both the batteries and drinking if we need it. So that was kind of a kill two birds with one stone way to bring water on the boat first as ice to cool all the stuff in the fridge. Gallon jugs that we're gonna use, put them in there. Maybe some more ice. We've talked about dry ice, but I don't think we need to get that extreme. Just put ice in there and only the things that absolutely have to be refrigerated. So we'll have it on until the moment we leave. So it'll be shut and cold and um, we'll keep it that way. And then when we go to leave shore, we'll go and keep that closed as much as we possibly can. Try to only get in there when you have to, get everything you need. I know this stuff sounds kind of conservative and frugal, but that's what we need to be to make sure we can run the important systems to get us um, all the way to Cuba. So another part of um, that plan, Philip got a polar bear cooler bag. Um, and it's uh, kind of like a Yeti knockoff. This is the brand that he found. And he said, good reviews, and it pretty much works as well as Yeti. It's uh, waterproof, you know, completely. Won't leak any water out, but just the zipper isn't as super high tech as Yeti. So it doesn't keep it as cold in that regard. But we'll put some ice packs in here as well, and that'll also be a backup fridge. Um, so those will be our two, you know, chilling pieces of equipment. 
And Philip got these guys, which I'm gonna make for you. Cooler Shock. They're supposed to be like the coldest, you know, ice packs you can make, and they hold temps like I think they have to be below zero to make them the first time. Kind of crazy. But we're gonna do that as well. So that's part of our contingency plan. Just definitely trying to think of all options to conserve power. Little battery operated lights that we've sort of put on everywhere. We like these little twinkle lights below the cabinets are really nice. So we've bought a lot of batteries for these guys. There you go. So you can get these at like, um, you yeah, know, Target, Walmart, Home Depot. Just, um, they're kind of a nice soft light at night and they do like twinkle like a candle, flicker, it's kind of nice. So these are great and we'll put these down below and they're flameless so they're nice um because we'll try not to use our cabin lights as much as possible during the evenings when we're down here cooking always try to use battery lights as much as we can another cool thing philip picked up uh, this is i thought it was five gallons maybe it's not at least this looks a little maybe it is five uh they're kind of like uh we'll call them bilge water bags so we can fill these with fresh drinking water and it will create a lot of weight, which is good because um, I'll show you we need to distribute weight in certain places strategically on the boat to make her sail better and more efficiently. Um, so these we can kind of move around. We can find like cubbies down in the bilge to stick them or different lockers, compartments, uh, reuse them, fill them back up. Uh, this is definitely going to be a good option. He got two of those. So we'll be using those for the trip as backup water supply. We have uh, 80 gallons that it holds in the tank, 40 on each side, starboard and port, and we can swap from port to starboard. Um, but we don't think we're going to be filling the water tanks in uh, Havana. Uh, Philip just kind of said from his research and what he's learned, it wouldn't be worth it to potentially contaminate uh, the tanks, so we won't be filling the water there. So we'll definitely do, we just want to make sure we have enough, you know, to make it on the trip or if something goes wrong and we're stranded out there for a while. We're definitely going to be very conservative, washing dishes and all of that. Um, anything we can do with salt water. Um, we'll do a pre-rinse of the dishes first with salt water. Probably ourselves, if it's not too cold, do a cold polar bear scrub with salt water. <laughs> um, I will especially, I'm far more conservative. Um, so definitely water is going to be another thing we'll be thinking about for the passage as well. Okay, wait. So wherever um, we put items and place items, we're always thinking about what they weigh and um, how they're going to ship sort of the ballast of the boat, you know, where we want weight to be distributed for sailing. We have our anchor chain, 200 feet of anchor chain in the bow. Way up there, you'll see the anchor chain locker. Um, so that's already a lot of weight up there, and we definitely want to move as much weight as possible back towards the stern to balance that out and hopefully overcompensate for it. We'd like more weight in the stern so the bow can kind of crest over waves and it'll make for a smoother ride. Um, so anything heavy we can put, any locker from like I'd say here back is a great thing. And we do have a lot of lockers in this area that we're gonna use creatively. We have uh, two here under the aft berth. That's really cool, the previous owner had it and it just creates an air pocket where mold can't uh, grow and live. Those are under all of our mattresses and that was just already there when we got the boat, but definitely a key component. So here's one here. Pretty big storage you'll see in here. And we've got, that's our starting battery there, but a couple of those items are like our sewing kit. Kind of light so we can reorder them and put really heavy things in here. Just wanna make sure it doesn't you know, get on our MPP controllers here. That's what we have, those two right there. And then those switches there are to turn off our solar power if we need to turn them on or off. So we'll be rearranging those. There's another compartment right there you'll see. And in there is um, a lot of our spare lines. We have like a spare halyard, spinnaker sheets, you know, kind of just a lot of, you know, call them ropes, but they're extra lines and sheets for the boat. Those are kind of heavy, but we'll see if we can get something heavier there. Maybe like water or canned goods or, you know, like the really heavy stuff. And then we have, um, some things we don't, you know, have to rearrange. We keep our trash can here and I do like it there, you know, but we could put heavy stuff there if we need instead, like wine, canned goods, things like that. And just have a separate trash bag, you know, maybe hanging on a, a rack or pole or something and we can make allowances for that. We also have here, it's where we generally keep our tool bag. Tool bag, which is pretty heavy, um, but it's not super accessible there, um, you know, cause you're not always grabbing for tools. But we may keep that out somewhere where we need to grab it more because we may have to do a lot of maintenance and work underway. We just don't know what's to be expected. But that leaves a really big cabinet here that is in the 
perfect place after the boat where we want to put a lot of weight. I think I'm going to do a lot of canned goods in there. Probably a lot of this stuff I think is going to go in there because that's a good place where we want to put a lot of weight. I just need to make sure and I'll show you. You don't want to throw things in a cabinet where it might, um, you know, upset other equipment or systems or wires. You do want to be careful of that. So we do want to just watch these hoses and here's our freshwater foot pump. You know, so just don't make sure you crush any of that. Wires in here, so that's good. There's our um, fuel filter. Nice viewing there, so you can see it. If you need to look and see if it's clogged, that's one last thing we have to do is um, check our fuel filters to make sure we don't need to polish our fuel before we go. Brandon said, um, you know, if they look good, and the filters look great. There's probably no reason to. So that's kind of one last thing on our list. You know, that's our cooking stuff now, but that's all very light and can be moved. So we can put some canned goods or maybe heavier bags in there since it's, um, you know, that door may not be able to hold a lot of weight. We don't want things to be falling out on the floor. So maybe some bagged, I'm thinking maybe chicken stocks might be good or bagged wine. We'll kind of make that decision. It's kind of snack cubby. This is where you reach in to get all the kind of good stuff quick and easy. We'll probably keep that that way because you need a place where you can just really pop down here and grab like some peanuts or a granola bar or, you know, something like that to really energize you and you need to just run up there and hold shift for like two hours. So probably keep that snack cubby. This is a real deep locker in here where we can um, put a lot of canned goods all the way back. And like I said, it's aft on the boat, so definitely a good deep place for weight. So we're going to fill that one with canned goods and anything heavy. And in the forward V berth, what we're planning is to put a big uh, worksheet out here so nothing, you know, stains it or gets the bed all real greasy and gross because uh, it looks super clean right now. I know, like Motel 6 sheets here. But we'll put a lot of light stuff up here sails, um, linens, towels, you know, clothes, anything like that that's coming with us but is light, we'll put up here because we want to keep the bow as light as possible. So that's the plan for this bed. And if you're asking well, where you're going to sleep, <laughs> on passage, uh, at least we don't sleep uh, in the V-berth. A, because it's uh, usually rocking around and moving too much. It's definitely, um, if we're in heavy seas, not a comfortable place to be. Um, and usually you want to be closer to the center line of the boat where it's going to be more stable and comfortable to sleep when you're underway. So we will probably be sharing the two berths here, depending on um, which tack we're on is, is all, all that's going to determine that. If there were more of us, we'd have to put up lee cloths, which you may see on other boats where they'll have like a hook, you know, and a cloth that comes up to keep you in the bed, you know, and run the whole length of it and kind of hook up here or somewhere. Um, we don't have those on our settees. But if you have lee cloths, it's nice because if you're on, say, you know, a starboard tack, so the boat's leaning this way and that's your only bunk to sleep in, you're going to have a real hard time getting comfortable enough to actually fall asleep. Um, that's where lead cloths come in handy. But with just the two of us, um, somebody be, will be up at every point in time. So there's only one person that will need to be sleeping at a time. So we'll just swap out with whichever bunk. And this is all of our cushions for the cockpit. Whichever bunk is satisfactory to the tack we're on, that is where Philip and I will sleep for the passage. We don't yet have a watch schedule. Uh, we haven't really talked about that. I'll have to touch base with Philip, but I'll just kind of executive decision jump in here because um, I've done a few passages now enough to know sort of what works. During the daytime we usually don't have a schedule. You just kind of whoever feels comfortable and rested stay up in the cockpit watch the conditions. You know during the day you can see the whole horizon so it's definitely not near as strenuous and you're kind of just team holding the helm as much as autopilot um, you know is handling everything it's pretty easy. And then at night I'm sure we will set watches Philip and I probably two hours on, two hours off is what I'm thinking starting at maybe, um, I do maybe 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. I think that would probably be good. That's when uh, everybody's kind of getting tired. Somebody needs to go to sleep. Uh, so 10 to midnight, midnight 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 6. And I like the sunrise ship, so I'll make sure I get that more often. But that'll be our general plan, and we'll do that, uh, you know, five days is going to be pretty interesting to see how our um, exhaustion levels are doing, you know, if we're getting really tired or if we feel totally energized. They say after like two or three days, your body kind of snaps into routine and it feels normal. It's not like 
up in the daytime, sleep at night. There's either on shift or off shift and your body just kind of adjusts to be energetic when you're on shift and it kind of starts to shut down when you go on off shift and you rest as much as possible when you don't have to be at the helm. Definitely don't try to stay awake just for the sake of it. Um, you need sleep, so just steal it whenever you can get it. Tiny little bit on our boxed wine. I think all boaters <laughs> use boxed wine, I swear. It's just the way to go. Um, I'm not super picky on taste. Uh, any wine tastes good to me. <laughs> Red, white, and everything in between. Um, so it's just definitely easy to tote on the boat. You get four bottles for kind of sometimes the price of one. It lasts a long time and it's greener, you know, and you don't have glass on the boat, you know, no bottles, so that's really cool. Um, what we often do, and we've been taught by other cruisers, this isn't a novel idea for us, but what you do is even when you buy a brand new box, just crack it open on the top, pop out the bag, and then you've got this great sealed up, especially when you first buy them, they have the little, you know, even the extra seal on here, and they're heavy, you know, not super heavy, but they have good weight to them, so you can distribute that where you want it. Like, like I said, we can pack that in the back of the boat to move weight aft, and they pack well. I mean, you can put them pretty much anywhere. Like I could put them down here in the boat. Bag of wine down there. And there you go. But just goes to show that the wine can be stowed in a lot of different places when it's in a bag like this, which is why it's great. And what we do though is you always keep one box, and I've seen some cruisers have it like for months the same box that's like falling apart about to just dissipate into nothing but they keep one as their dispenser box that way you've always got one that you pop your bag in pull your spout out and then you've got your box one and voila wine for everybody super easy that's how you still wine on a boat Another cool thing uh, we picked up, Philip went shopping when I was in Isla Mujeres, he came back and he had a whole Amazon Prime stack of boxes in the corner and he just went shopping Christmas for Cuba. But he saw this on Ryan's boat, Libra, as we were headed to Mexico, Isla Mujeres. And Ryan had bought this book to kind of help him out. And I'll tell you, honestly, I'll have to find it. Emergencies technical. Okay, so here's all the really cool stuff. And we used it, Ryan and I, to ask about <laughs> transmission. <laughs> and it was like, no fresco agua in el transmisión, because we weren't getting fresh water in the transmission. Um, so it's definitely just the kind of things cruisers need to ask and um, get translations for. So it's definitely geared for cruisers. Great little book, you know, you can look up all your different phrases. And they make it waterproof, which is smart. Um, so cool item if you're going to go to a Spanish-speaking country. Um, we'll talk about our Delorme next time. It's part of our safety equipment. And we'll be doing our um, map share. So you guys will all get to follow us on Facebook and hear how everything is going. I'll do a little post so you can see how to do that and message us along the way. I tried this for the first time during our voyage to Isla Mujeres, linking the Delorme map share posts to Sail Libra's Facebook page, and I thought it turned out really well. Here you can see the public posts that we write during the passage and click the link to see exactly where we are in the Gulf. These are the posts you'll see on Have Wind Will Travel's Facebook page as we voyage to Cuba. Other for passage, uh, we're very kind of dictators about stowing things. Uh, there's just nothing out on the counters, tabletops, uh, countertops, anything, because there can't be. It'll go all over the floor. And even bags on the floor. Some people, when we traveled with Mitch, um, he had a big duffel bag, which is, I mean, great for the passage, and you definitely need that to stow all your stuff. But we kept it under the table right here, and it would always come spilling out, and all of his contents are kind of right here in the walkway as you're trying to navigate, you know, through a tossing, turning boat. Uh, it can be a real danger if stuff's on the floor, so we definitely put everything where it needs to go. I've got an iPad here. That's not going to be there. Right here. Uh, soft goods, even the pillows, because the pillows will start like toppling onto the floor. And all these we'll put um, probably in a locker. Uh, even our disco ball. Did y'all see our disco ball? Disco Inferno. Nothing cool. Get a little tired. <laughs> we'll stow the disco ball away. Put him in here. Make sure he's nice and safe. And then our Canberra gel, which we always keep out. Fantastic product to stop the growth of mold in the boat. So now this side on the starboard, because we have this sort of tethered in, this side's good to go. 
That's what you want it to look like when you go on passage. Nothing anywhere that can tumble. Sometimes these will open up on us just because it's like too much banging around and some of this stuff can crash out, you know, that'll happen on occasion because these things are getting a little older. They're just a plastic sort of pop-in piece um, and they're not like a super duper hold. Um, and we can replace those if we want, you know, just to make sure the lockers are even tougher than they are now. And we love that our sink is here because we will probably keep a water jug and some cups for drinking in the sink. Um, we may also put, um, we'll put a stopper in and might put a couple bags of peanuts, granola bars, kind of emergency food. You, know, you want all things secure so nothing tumbles out on the floor. I've probably said that like eight times and I don't care because it's true. You come down here in the dark and you're swaying and you're rocking and you step on something and sprain your ankle, it's not going to be a fun trip for you. So that's safety first. So I hope this has helped you kind of see how we're planning to stock and stow and prepare the boat for passage, mostly down below, how to keep everything um, stowed in a strategic way where it's easy to access and put in a way that best uh, benefits the boat, its movement and its sail efficiency. And once I get all this put away, which I will stow in inventory and all of that goes in the cockpit, then it's all clean and the boat will be ready to make the five day passage to Cuba. Philip and I are super excited to make this trip just the two of us it's gonna be really cool you know to just say that just we did that just he and I and we're excited to take you along with us definitely follow along uh, the map share tracking which is on uh, map share where we do public posts like hey conditions are great today we've got two to three foot rollers it's sunny it's beautiful caught a big fish or whatever happened um, those will go on Facebook and you'll click there's a Delorme link it just looks kind of like a funky box that's um, our location so you can click that open see where we're at in the Gulf and um, patrons can message us and talk to us along the way. So definitely jump on there and follow us along. We'll start posting on December 16th, weather permitting, if that's a good day to leave, but that's as soon as we can cast off and head out to Cuba. So we're happy to take you with us now that the boat is ready to go. Thanks for watching. Be sure to go to havewindwilltravel.com to check out all of the stories, posts, photos, videos, books, blogs, and cruising opportunities we post there in order to help you get out on the water too. Get inspired and get on board.